Welcome to the Ancient Sculpture Museum here at uh, Pyramid Hill Sculpture Park. My name is Dr. Stephen Tuck. I'm a professor of, among other things, ancient art at my university. And um, this little tour of the Ancient Sculpture Museum is entitled Images of Death. I used to call it the I See Dead People Tour, but uh, my students don't get that reference anymore because they're too young. Um, but nevertheless, what we're going to do is spend about 30 minutes here looking at some of the images of, um, of death throughout the collection. Um, and you can come back, of course, later when the museum is open and take a look at these things in person yourself. But I always like to start with this uh, Egyptian sarcophagus here. Um, this is a wonderful piece for telling us about belief in the afterlife, um, hope for resurrection, and so on. Um, this is a coffin that we actually can read the name of the, of the deceased because we have the hieroglyphics out here. And if you look closely, some of those hieroglyphics are in these little oval surrounds. That indicates the name of the deceased. Ank Takalak is his name, or was his name. Um, he was a, a priest of the god Amun-Ra at Karnak, which is the largest um, religious sanctuary site, biggest temple ever built in human history, period, full stop massive complex of Egypt. Um, the, uh, the sarcophagus here is carved with his likeness on the outside because the Egyptians believed that at the moment of death your ka or your soul left the body and only after a number of prayers and certain rituals were undertaken um, would it rejoin the body in the afterlife and it, but it had to recognize you and so you needed the image of the deceased on the outside there um, so that it could figure out which body went with that soul. In addition to his facial features, though, there's a lot of other things that indicate um, high status. Uh, this wig, um, he originally had a beard that was set in there, and of course he's got spells of protection all around to make sure that the body makes it through into um, the underworld securely where it and the soul can be rejoined. And so I love this coffin, it's just a marvelous piece. Um, and also, one other thing about it that you can't see very well, so you've got to come into the museum, is if you come around here and take a look at the bottom, you'll see that they made a mistake when they started to make this. They didn't make it long enough. Um, the base is actually pieced. Um, they had to add a piece to it to, uh, to make it long enough for the mummy. It's that, uh, that problem of stuff made the day after the weekend, you know, <laughs> it's a long problem. Anyway, coffin of Aunt Takala. I think it's a great um, image of death. There's one other Egyptian piece here I want to show you as well, which I, I just find charming. It's a, it's a couple statue here in granite. It's also a Ka statue. It's designed so that the souls would recognize these individuals. It would be placed outside the tomb so that the souls could come in. It's also heavily um, engraved with hieroglyphics um, with the spells and prayers necessary to restore the soul. What we have are two individuals here who are high status. Um, he has the long kilt and he has the little thing in his hand which indicates he's an overseer. Essentially that thing that's in his hand is the equivalent of a blackjack. It's for beating people. Um, it indicates overseer status. She has the long wig um, and the, the little diadem, again, indicating high status individuals. Um, and what I love most is the fact that she has her hand on his shoulder when she's reaching out and touching him. That used to be interpreted as a sign of affection, of, um, of the wife trying to connect to the husband. However, we realize now, through the work of some smart Egyptologists, that that's not the case. Um, this is a, a, a symbol that we find with a high status woman and a lower status husband. She's actually conferring her status on him through touch. The way, say, you know, a monarch knights somebody by touching them, right? Okay? Um, and so her touch isn't just affection there. Her touch is conveying her, her higher status um, to her husband. Um, and one last thing about them that I really like is if you can see it, the light is just right in between their legs there. You find another name in that cartouche, in that oval surround. And that is the name of um, the high status prince whose household they're in. Okay? So that also conveys status by who it is they work for. Okay? And that's the name of the prince they work for down there. I love, love these, uh, this couple statue here as well. 
Well, that idea of portraiture in death is, uh, is been around for a long time. We see two great Egyptian uh, examples here, but there's other examples also in, um, in um, the other cultures throughout. And I wanted to turn now to a couple of examples here in the Greek collection, because these are also, um, I think, really nice. And I like this one um, quite a bit. Uh, this is a grave marker from a Greek grave. Um, it dates to, I'm going to say exactly 380 BC, um, because we know where the cemetery was, we know where the grave was, we know where all the other family members were buried, we know a lot about this one. Um, because it's got the names carved above their heads there. And so we, we can trace these people and the rest of the members of their family. Uh, the shape is kind of weird, because the shape actually is broken off a bit at the top and the bottom. It's a perfume jar. And it's an indicator of uh, a piety, um, because when somebody died in the ancient Greek world, um, you'd lay the body out generally for three days at home and anoint it with perfume. Um, and so these perfume jar shaped um, um, tomb markers um, become a symbol of the piety of the family. Uh, what we have is a younger woman here um, and an older man. If you look at him, you can see he's kind of stooped over. He has male pattern baldness. He's a little thick around the center. And uh, very often these stooped guys also have a, a stick they're leaning on. Um, and they're shaking hands here, which is a, is a, um, a farewell gesture. They're saying goodbye. Um, I think this is his, um, his tomb marker. And you can see his name there. Um, um, let's say, Thokritos and her name Philte there. And we know both of those names are on other tombs in the family cemetery. All the rest of the markers from this cemetery are in the National Archaeological Museum collection in Athens. And then this one is in Hamilton, Ohio. <laughs> I like that a lot. Um, and it's a nice, again, an intimate gesture there. Um, the idea of a wish for life after death that we saw with Anatakala exists in the Greek world as well. And we see it in this Greek um, heroes um, right here, to steal it. It's carved with the name of the guy, Theodorus, up there. So this is Theodorus here. And it's an odd arrangement. It's hard to see what's actually going on. Um, but what he's holding in his hands here is a pan scale. Are you familiar with that? Where you have, um, you have um, a center stick and then a stick across and then two chains with pans and then it goes up and down. And he's weighing his soul. Right? And the goal here is to weigh your soul to see whether or not you're judged good. Um, the vast majority of people in the Greek world went to an underworld which was unremarkable. But some very bad people actually were punished in the underworld, in the Greek world. And you, you want to avoid that. Okay? I'm just going to go on a limb and say, it doesn't go well for those people. So this soul weighing um, symbol is it's very rare in Greek art. There's maybe, I don't know, 10 or 12 examples in all of Greek art which show the soul way. And one of them is this grave stele, um, which is designed to sit up on top of the grave. You can see it's got a little uh, a tenon there, which fit into a little hole in a base above, um, well, above Theodorus' um, tomb there. And there he is. And you can tell by, I think, by the look on his face that things are going okay. <laughs> I think he might make it. Okay, so I like these Greek examples too. You see that continuity of life after death, the, the intimacy of, um, of people in the afterlife. Um, but it's the fear of destruction in the afterlife or of punishment that seems to be driving a lot of these people. Completely different than what we find other places. We're going to look at that one right there, which is one of my favorites. I have favorite images of dead people. Um, I got a good cable, that's where I'm going to stay on the Netflix. And, uh, but this is Etruscan. I don't know if you know anything about the Etruscans. The Etruscans are the native inhabitants of Italy. They were there when the Romans got there. Okay? So they're the native inhabitants of what is today Tuscany. Okay? So they knew something about real estate, right? Um, and the Etruscan image of the afterlife is completely different than the others. There's no notion here of avoiding punishment. 
in most of these. What it is, is it's a party. This guy is wearing his nicest clothes. He's wearing a toga, which we associate with the Romans. They got it from the Etruscans. And what he has in his hand there, his right hand, is, is a wine cup. It's a particular type of vessel for drinking wine. He's reclining here, which is what you do in upper class feasting, and he's preparing himself for a banquet in the afterlife. This is the Etruscan notion of the afterlife. You're out in nature on the riverbank, you exercise, you run races, you sing songs, you do dances, and then in the evening, you all get together and feast. And we have descriptions of this. Um, and the Etruscan afterlife, it's the one I hope is right. Um, <laughs> it's, um, it's pretty nice. And we don't have his name. It would have originally been painted across here, but the paint is, is long gone. But we have enough paint left to see what he looked like. And there's, uh, I think, a really cheerful image of the afterlife there and um, a notion of a wine, wine in a banquet in this one. Quite a bit. So we've had Egyptian, Greek, one interesting image of the afterlife. I want to just show you a couple of Roman ones as well, so you can get a sense of um, how the Romans adopted some of these ideas. And we're going to take a look over here. We don't have a lot of images of Roman women um, because for most of the period of ancient Rome, images of women were not put up in public. There are no images of women in the forum or in the law courts and things like that. The only place you'd find portraits of women would be on their graves, and only those actually pretty late. And so we're very fortunate to have this image of a Roman woman. And I like it quite a bit because she's very stylish. And she's stylish in two ways. Um, first off, it's a portrait, okay? It's absolutely a portrait. It's not an idealized image. Her hairstyle, center parted and pulled back, um, is the very standard hairstyle for the empress at this time. But also, what's really cool is, do you see what she's got on her head here? Can you tell what that is? It's a diadem. She has a diadem. It's like a little a tiara that she's wearing here. Um, and the wonderful thing about that is, um, is that at this exact moment, the empresses in Rome in the first century AD are conflating their identity with the goddess Venus, right? Venus, who was claimed to be the founder of the dynasty that was ruling at the time. And this young woman um, has a her funerary portrait and also has the diadem of the goddess Venus. She's adopting the hairstyle and the fashion of the very highest people. She's emulating um, the high status individuals at that time. Um, I don't know if you guys ever read the Daily Mail online. <laughs> Just me? You ever read the Daily Mail? Oh, it's great. Because um, all of the gossip um, pictures, they're wonderful. Because if you go on the Daily Mail, they'll, they'll have a picture of, I don't know, somebody, uh, Kim Kardashian, right? Okay, and there's a picture of her going out somewhere, and then the ad right next to it is um, they're, they're, they're selling knockoff copies of her dress from the day before already, so you can dress exactly like her. That level of emulation is wonderful and completely Roman, and I love that, that, that we have this portrait. It's very rare to have these first century funerary portraits of women, and that this one emulating the, um, the, the deity and, um, and the empresses. So good, so good. Okay, um, I'm gonna make our way down to the very end and, and have a big finish down there, okay? All right, great, let's take a look at this. of the Roman sarcophagi that we have. There's six more pieces of Roman sarcophagi behind you with images on them and one out in the courtyard, which is really cool. Um, but this is the best preserved one, so it's easiest to see everything that's going on. A Roman sarcophagus was a big stone box, usually six to seven feet long, three to four feet deep, um, and only carved on the front face because they're usually put in niches 
push back in tomb so you can only see the front face of it. And this is a very well preserved Roman sarcophagus from the third century AD. And in the center there, we have the deceased. All right? Um, I like this guy. Um, he's solemn. You see the downturned mouth? This guy is serious. There's no frivolity here. He's wearing his toga. He's got male pattern baldness. A very attractive feature, right? <laughs> yes. Um, he is a solemn individual. And he also tells us what he cares about. Because down below here, I don't know if you can make out what those are. Family yeah. tragedy. Yes, theater masks. Theater masks here and here. And in between there is a scroll. Okay? There's a scroll, which is the ancient equivalent of a book, with a little tab on it, which would have had the title painted on it. Um, and so this is a guy who's identifying himself partially by the theater. Okay? Um, he may be an actor, he may be a playwright, he may just be a patron of the theater. Um, because what we have on the other two sides are really interesting. We have these small images flanking him, which are bucolic figures. I don't know if you can tell, they're shepherds. Here's a guy, and he's dressed like a shepherd, he's not wearing a toga, he's wearing a tunic, he's got his stick in his bag, there's a sheep down there at his feet, and a tree behind him, and there's another shepherd here with a dog jumping up on him. These aren't just any shepherds, these are specific shepherds. These are the shepherds that are in one of the most famous Roman poets, poems that existed, and that's by the poet Virgil. Okay? Virgil's Eclogues, okay? writing about the bucolic life and the beauty of nature and pastoral poetry and all that. Um, well, by the time this guy died, Virgil's stuff is like 400 years old. Okay? This is like me putting scenes from, I don't know, King Lear on my sarcophagus, okay? because I identify with Shakespeare. Virgil, here in the late third century, though, is having a resurgence, um, a renaissance of Virgil. Um, and so this guy is completely identifying himself by his high status Roman culture, theater, books, and um, Virgilian poetry here. Um, I think this sarcophagus is actually probably from North Africa. There were a lot of people at this time in North Africa who, um, uh, were Roman citizens, but new Roman citizens. And they become more Roman than the people in Rome because we see them asserting their citizenship throughout with their names and their identity and their, their patronage and such. So I, I think there's a good chance that this is actually a sarcophagus from a Roman citizen in North Africa in the late third century, really telling us he's celebrating his culture here. And that's how he wants to be known for the rest of his, well, ever. <laughs> so these are just some of the images of, um, of death that we have. Um, there's some others, of course. There's a marvelous banquet scene over there of a man reclining to dine with his wife and his kids by, uh, beside him, um, watching him. He's the deceased there. Um, but uh, there's, a, there's a number of these here, as well as a number of other um, really interesting pieces. A lot of images of Egyptian, Greek, and Roman mythology. Um, and a lot of great pieces here. So um, if you get a chance, come by, um, come to the Ancient Sculpture Museum. Um, there's always uh, some really fascinating pieces here. Okay? Thanks a lot.